being a creative is, is kind of an analytical thing because you're writing a song. You're looking at different ways a song could go, different outlets of the story, and you do that with your own life. We're all from small towns, and we started this thing outside of Nashville, and it was just kids literally trying to play a house show to, to a few people. And it's crazy that something that you've created with your hands and with your minds, and just out of nothing, you created this thing that all around the world has impacted people. You're the soundtrack of their life. So I grew up outside of Nashville, Tennessee, about 45 minutes south. Looking back now, when you get exposed to the world, you see how small of a town it can be. But I mean, it was the usual things. You know, we didn't have a movie theater or anything like that. So Friday night, football games were a big deal. Anyone from in LA or New York or Chicago would look at, at where I grew up and think it was a small town. But you still, I mean, it made you who you are. It developed you. You learn a lot of big life lessons. And there's a piece of you that, that's, that you kind of always take with you. It's always funny when people come on the road, like if someone's like on our bus for some reason has to roll with us. Like, oh, I didn't sleep well last night, like, and, which blows my mind because I sleep so good on the bus. And I realize it's because we spent years, like I remember being in vans and literally like learning how to lay underneath all the bench seats mm -hmm. or that perfect spot where you can like lay on the bench seat and prop your feet up on the window mm -hmm. and you have a good hour before your leg falls asleep, <laughs> but that's a good like 45 minutes of you sleep. Just, you just want to fall asleep before your leg falls asleep yeah. and then you're good to go. I grew up just southwest of Atlanta, Georgia, in a small town called uh, Peachtree City, uh, also known as Fayetteville. We lived in a, in a subdivision for a while when I was a kid, and uh, but when I was a little bit older, 10, 11, we moved um, out to the country a little bit. Growing up in Dalton, it was cool as a kid. We used to make stuff to do. My buddy had a farm. We'd go out there and ride four-wheelers and tear up his uh, grandfather's land, to which he still gives me trouble about that. It was just a small town. It was a nice little town, you know, a good family town. Definitely no music going on there, for sure. <laughs> I grew up in a small town in Kentucky called Lawrenceburg. It was a great place to grow up, and it was really kind of quaint and quiet. It was the kind of place where everybody had a farm. Even if that's not your primary thing, you still have a farm. I was born in, in uh, Knoxville, Tennessee, but moved by the time I was two or three uh, to Snellville, Georgia. Um, when you drive, into Snellville, the welcome sign says, uh, welcome to Snellville, where everybody's somebody. They recently changed it to where everybody could be somebody. <laughs> so I don't really know why, but now it's Snellville where everybody could be somebody. We all like a lot of the same kinds of songs and, and bands from not just like uh, new age sounding stuff, but older stuff too. But that also is what makes us different. Going from a little bit of a suburbia feel to more of a small town country feel, uh, less neighbors, less noise. I think that really uh, shaped my childhood and my, my, what I did a lot. Like I rode dirt bikes, I you know, was outside a lot, but I also had time to be by myself and, and learn how to play uh, instruments. Having that time in the space to do that really sparked my uh, music beginning. There wasn't necessarily a specific moment that got me into playing music, but um, I just, it was always something that was in me, I don't know. So uh, one day I just asked my parents for a drum kit and they're like, uh, no, it, it'd be really loud. I had missed soccer signups. Um, so I was, I was pretty upset about it, um, but my pop said, you know, I'm not gonna let you just sit around and do nothing. So is there something else you've been wanting to do? So I said, you know, I, I have, I do, th do think it'd be cool to, to play guitar. And so he took me from uh, the soccer fields to the music store and bought me this cheap acoustic Fender Squire acoustic guitar. And then he continued to pay for guitar lessons for me for the next like seven or eight years. They finally gave in after me kind of being like a <laughs> annoying little kid and uh, bought me a drum kit and I just went and sat in the backyard and played. You know, I wanted to be John Bonham, I wanted to be Dave Grohl, you know. I wanted to have long hair and play drums for a living. I wanted to be on stage and the lights. That's just all I ever wanted to do. I think of bands and I'm like, to me, they were gods among men. Like they were like this crafted, incredible thing. Like they weren't a normal person. And then when, yeah, people will say like, oh, you're my favorite band, it's my favorite song, you, you know, whatever it is, you're like, 
Us? Like, you should, like, <laughs> well. <laughs> Playing in front of people uh, was most commonly done in church for me, and so I learned a lot of hymns and a lot of worship music, and country and gospel have always shared a little bit. There's always been a little bit of a mesh there. I grew up in church, and so there was a lot of music there that was kind of a catalyst to start learning how to play instruments and so I grew up writing from a very early age and I was in bands throughout all of high school and I could only write about my reality and my reality was growing up near a factory, growing up on the other side of the train tracks, growing up and, and being bored on a Friday night. And that was the beginning of developing a a mindset where you look around you, taking that and, and putting it into words and putting it into to melodies. It was taking reality and putting it into music and, and celebrating reality. The songs that related to me growing up were the ones that were singing about my life. And so country music has always been one of those things where it's about common folk. You know, it's about the people. It's about my life. I, when, when people are singing about, you know, bonfires and things like that, I know it sounds so cliche, but that is what we did growing up, you know, and there's no better way to describe it. I think I just loved music. Um, I just remember riding in the back of my mom's old Chevy van, just laying in the bench seat, just listening to whatever she had on, playing the air drums and playing the air guitar and like just dreaming about being a rock star, you know, just like anybody does. We all bailed out of having to have real jobs. I was about to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, none of us had backup plans either. Yeah. Um, which still don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when I started writing songs, I realized I couldn't write pop songs. I couldn't write songs um, about LA or about New York or about the big city lights because I'd never been there. Country music songwriting is where I belong because it's stories and I my songs always ended up being stories. I started going down to the Bluebird Cafe and, and started being exposed to the songwriting world. Started being exposed to open mics and I went to college though and got an internship at a studio and started working there and learning how a studio works and learning how music on the recording side of it works. Every semester was my last semester as far as I was concerned because the next semester I was moving back to Nashville and I was gonna be a songwriter, be an artist. Um, so I did that all through college and ended up graduating. And um, But while in college, that's when I started to meet the guys in the band. I was playing in a band with my brother. We got booked at this thing called Theta Palooza in Cleveland, Tennessee. As our van rolls in, we like drop the trailer and I hear this guy go, Theta Palooza. I looked out and there were six people in the crowd. But I was like, dude, he just screamed that. Like he is playing in front of like 90,000 at Bonnaroo. Either he's awesome or he's crazy. Either way, I gotta meet him. So it was Brandon. <laughs> so that night we like hung out. We just became friends. Like we were hanging out a lot in town and he came over one day and he was like, dude, I've got some songs I really want to start a band. I believed in bands. I loved the creativity that bands brought because I had done some solo things in college and it's just, there was such a freedom when everyone seemed to be involved in the creative process, um, and it made you better. And so I wanted to start a band. We were just trying to record the songs and get like a sound, and uh, one day I was like, dude, I'm, I've, I've got this guy's number. I'm gonna call him and see if he'll come play with us, and it was Eric. You know, you just click with people sometimes, and, and it was cool, and I really liked and appreciated all the songs that Brandon was writing. So us three kind of, we're playing together for a while. And uh, Eric was like, well, I've got two buddies that uh, I've played with in the past that are really good, and you want me to bring them along? And I was like, yeah, that'd be awesome. Eric called me and he was like, hey, you play bass, right? And I was like, yeah, I do. And he goes, well, I've been uh, jamming with these two guys and we need a bass player. Eric was like, hey man, I've been playing in this band and uh, they need somebody else to come play. And I was like, cool. He's like, what can you play? And I was like, dude, I don't know what you guys are looking for. He's like, man, we've been really thinking about a lap steel. And I didn't have a lap steel. I can't play lap steel. And I was like, sure. <laughs> and so uh, I kind of joined the band under false pretenses, but I did bring, instead of a lap steel, I did bring a mandolin, banjo, and a keyboard. I was playing the odds. I was like, hey, just distract them with as many other instruments as I can. Maybe they'll keep me. We had met and started jamming for a few weeks, and I was like, here's some songs. and. And then I booked a show at the end. And once we played that show, because that's always kind of the break. I, I've been in enough bands to know like stage chemistry is very different than jam chemistry. And after our first show, I was like, this is it. These are the guys, this is a great show. There was just that chemistry, you know, it worked. We didn't have a place to practice. And so one night I was like, dude, I work at this carpet warehouse. Everyone leaves like around seven and they have this huge loft. 
we could like get all our equipment up here, take the forklift and lift it up top and practice, I don't think anyone would ever know. So we made a habit of doing that. You know, every night around 7, 7.30, I'd work late. And once everyone was out of there, I'd be like, all right, come on, it's time. And we did that for, I want to say several years till I got caught because we left our gear up there, covered it up with the rugs and left out a bunch of beer cans. So, sorry, Doug. <laughs> My dad got an RV. We borrowed the RV for a weekend and that we didn't give it back for a year and a half. And we just hit the road, lived in the RV, would try and sell our CDs. And so I'd made some t-shirts and we sold enough t-shirts or just begged for money. We could afford gas to get back and we would just stop at like gas stations and put the slide out in the RV and just all sleep in there. It was an all or nothing. There was no plan B. It was like, you know what? This is a crazy opportunity. We worked hard, we all lost our jobs and we have this music. What's the worst that can happen other than a good story? We basically, like, everyone was like, you must see so many cool places on the road. And it's like, we see a lot of green rooms and, and hotel rooms and venues, but, you know, we were driving ourselves. So we were we showing were up at like two or three. Showing up just in time for sound check. You know, this whole thing started with us all hanging out at a house in Donaldson and playing these records. And there, there have been weird moments where we'll all be sitting around and our friends will co even come out on the road. And it's all the same people that were at that Donaldson house and maybe even the same records playing. And I'm like, this is our living room. Six years ago, <laughs> it's yeah. just, just going down the road at 70 miles an hour. <laughs> we spent a long time pulling up to venues and playing to three people, including the bartenders. And then, you know, the first time we play that city, it would be three or four people. And maybe a few months later, would come back and they, they told their friends about it. So maybe there'd be 10 or 15 people. And then, you know, then 50 people and then 100. There has to be people out there. If you're going to have fans, if this actually works, you want it to be people that understand, that you have something in common with, that you could feel like you could walk off stage and go back to the bar and hang out with them. And I think that's one thing that we try to provide in our music, not just our song or our lyrics, but um, the way that we uh, perform music. Them knowing that it's honest makes it easier for them to relate to our music. Um, and I think that also translates when we play live. We love our music and it gets us excited and it makes us want to move and like, we hope that's contagious and we see that it's contagious. I think they find a piece of themselves or their town or their loved ones in our music. The fans, you know, they, they come for a night, then they leave, but you have to do it again the next night. So if it's not authentic, if you're not proud of it, if you're not excited to walk on stage with this message, to me, there's no point in doing it. I think having five different personalities like this also helps. When we're trying to like build this band from the ground up, we go through a lot together and we have been through a lot together. There's aspects of all of our personalities that are helpful in different situations of, that we go through. And there's some that aren't helpful in certain situations. <laughs> uh, but you have those other ones that like kind of balance each other out. Just having all these different kind of personalities to, to help you get through those times. It's just nice to always have someone you can lean on. We started figuring out our sound. It was kind of bad at first because we, we hung out a lot and didn't get as much done. But also at that same time was the beginning of our friendship. We were our own little community and I became friends with some of their friends and we just started this community from the ground up. I look back at it as a really special time. It was the genesis of a friendship, the genesis of a band. We're all different people than we were when we started this journey just because we've matured. I mean, we've gotten older, we've grown together and it's hard to describe to like your family, you know, when you come off the road, they want to know details and it's like, you kind of have another family that's just on the road. We've gotten to do a lot together and experience a lot together and it's so cool to get to have a band that work that's so hard to do but it's so cool to get to do that with some of your best friends it feels really surreal that we're on our own headlining tour now and have our own light show and are selling out these venues and have all these fans coming out to see us because it really wasn't always like that and i think in those times where it, it kind of seem like we were running into a dead end. The friendship that we had and the fact that we could share those hardships together kind of helped us spur one another on and, and keep going. A real love story has to, has to have a journey and it has to have questions and doubt and at the same time recovering and hope and joy and it's, you know, it's a journey. I'm proud of who I am today and I'm proud of who the band is. I wouldn't change anything because I wouldn't want to change who we've ended up as. When I look around, like it's, it's, I can't believe we did that. Yeah. We're just like, yeah. <laughs> look at we're us. We're kind of uh, <laughs> it's a, a hot mess. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's pretty wild, but we're really fortunate. I think that 
always remember where you came from and remembering your beginning makes you even more thankful for, for where you're at.